You're listening to 50 Pirates in 50 Days on the Sports Objective Podcast. A new era of East Carolina football is here and will begin on August 31st when Mike Houston leads the Pirates into action at NC State. Between now and then, join us for a daily trip down memory lane as we experience Pirate football through the words of men who made those memorable moments happen. Here's your host, Bubba Rosenbaum. Welcome into the Sports Objective Podcast. Uh, I'm Bubba Rosenbaum, and we're continuing on with our 50 Pirates in 50 Days series. Uh, here recently, uh, a few shows ago, we caught up with Jerry Tolley from the Clarence Stasevich era, era, excuse me, and now we're very excited to catch up with a former pirate from that era, Jim Gudger. And Jim, welcome in. Hey, thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. We appreciate your time. I'm very excited to talk about your time with the Pirates. Uh, I know I. Uh, Let's just go back uh, to your recruitment. I know uh, you were from um, the Cullowee area in the western part of the state. Uh, you were at Silver Webster High School. Uh, I, b- I believe that is now Smoky Mountain High School, correct? That is correct. Okay. So um, during those years, I, kn- I remember uh, seeing in an article that Ron Cherubini did, uh, you said you were recruited by Davidson College and then also East Carolina. Uh, so it was actually um, – a connection that your dad, who had been the coach of Western Carolina, had developed with Clarence Stasevich that led you to being a pirate, correct? That is correct. So um, talk a little bit about that process and um, and um, the way you ended up in Greenville. Well, uh, I only had two scholarship offers uh, coming out of high school. I played at Civil Webster under Babe Howell, who was legendary there. He, I think <clears throat> when he died, he <clears throat> was either – the winningest high school coach in North Carolina or one of the, or the top two or three or something, but uh, uh, it was a very good program. We won, and of course, now at Sil Webster, I played under three different head coaches. Uh, Joe Hunt was the head coach my sophomore year, and we won the Western Championship. They didn't have a state championship in 2A back then. And then Frank Manley came in, uh, Coach uh, Hunt left and went to Hendersonville. Frank Manley came in and coached us uh, my junior year. And uh, we didn't do very well that year, but that's the year we integrated the schools. I played with a great player named Tommy Love, who ended up playing at Michigan State. Uh, And then my senior year, Babe Howell came in, and we won the 2A championship again. And then, uh, like I said, I had two scholarship offers, one to Davidson, one to East Carolina. I did pretty good on the college boards, but uh, after I'd signed my scholarship one day, I got a letter from Davidson that said something like, uh, we're sorry you're too stupid to get in school here. So I went to East Carolina. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I saw I, I'd read that in that article as well, and I I was wondering if that was. I figured uh, that that was something that, you, as far as the way it was worded, that you had maybe uh, exaggerated that just for, kind of for the story, or, or was it, did they uh, was that something no, that I, they actually they actually sent no. it out that way? <laughs> Well, I mean, they didn't say it in those words, but right, I, right. I yeah, I, 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 went, uh, I think I made eleven hundred on the college boards, and you had to make like thirteen hundred to get in. And after my college board scores, they they uh, politely uh, declined right to have me to have me attend Davidson. That's when Dave Fag was the head football coach down there. They had uh, Davidson was a lot bigger in football back then. They had, gosh, Franklin Brooks, and I can't remember. Some of them went on to legendary college coaching careers at places like UCLA. Uh, that was uh, that's a good bunch of coaches down there at Davidson then. But but fortunately for me, uh, I ended up at East Carolina, and I guess my daddy was a basketball coach at Western Carolina and had been there for, I don't know, 20 years and had known Clarence Stasevich uh, right. when he was at Lenore Ryan very well, Hanley Painter and some of those real old-timers. And I guess that's how uh, I got in contact with East Carolina. And anyway, they looked at film and they offered me a scholarship. So that's that's why I went down there and have never regretted it at all. Just glad it happened that way. So, in addition to football, um, did you play other sports in high school? I did. I actually uh, I actually played center in basketball and was probably a better high school basketball player than I was football player. The, the problem with was. Uh, there wasn't a real big demand for six foot one centers in college basketball. <laughs> so, 
So right. uh, I, I concentrated on football. I, I thought about going out for basketball at East Carolina, but I never did. So after you arrived in Greenville, um, there it was, I guess it was 1966, and you were part of the freshman team. And I know that freshman team is one that uh, was extremely successful. You got, you guys uh, won every game you played, correct? That's correct. We were undefeated. Back then, uh, freshmen weren't eligible to play on the varsity. So schools all had freshman teams. We must have had 110, 120 freshmen uh, that year. And uh, it's funny, I, I registered one year, and we had uh, five years later, there were four of us, or I can't remember, four or five of us that had started together as freshmen out of that 110 or 120 uh, back in 1966. Uh, I, I, was t- I was down this weekend at the scrimmage, and uh, Dwight Flanagan was one of them, and we were talking about that. It, uh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say the head coach of that team was um, Henry Van Sant, uh, who went on to later on uh, earn his doctorate, and um, he was an East Carolina administrator. And we'll talk talk more about him because I know he was someone that was extremely important and influential in, in your life and um, in the path you took. But uh, um, continuing to talk about your time there um, after your freshman season or your season on that on that freshman team, uh, Clarence Stasevich. Uh, and so you you had actually started your time as um, uh, actually a quarterback or blocking back in that single wing offense, and then you transitioned over to the defensive line, right? That's correct. Huh. Uh, you know, back then, uh, Coach Stasser, we were one of the last teams, if not the last college team uh, in the country, to run the single wing. And, you know, the blocking back was called – he called us quarterbacks. But as you know, I mean, we call the plays in the huddle. We call the snap count at the line. But as you know, they snap the ball directly to the tailback or the, foot, to, or the fullback, and the blocking back was the lead blocker on uh, all the running plays. Uh, I guess it was uh, – they got offenses today that are kind of similar to that. Uh, I can't remember what they call them, where they snap the ball directly to the – Right. Uh, a lot of it um... – the first time, I mean, obviously, I'm sure it was done before this, but the one that really popularized it and uh, got a name for it was uh, when Houston Nutt was at Arkansas, and he was calling it the Wild Hog uh, when he had um, had um, Darren McFadden that was so good. Yeah, the Wildcat. Wasn't it the Wildcat off there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Arkansas, yeah, Arkansas called it yeah. the Wild Hog. But, yeah, generally speaking, you hear it referred to as the Wildcat. Yeah, and then I uh, – my – uh, soft, after my sophomore year, I had an injury, and I redshirted what would have been my junior year. And we came back. We hit, uh, and I'll be perfectly honest with you, this is a good thing. Uh, you know, we had the first black player ever at East Carolina on our freshman team in 1966, Paul Scott. He was a tight end, and he was a, he was a real gentleman. Uh, by the time I was a redshirt junior, we had, you know, I was considered big and fast. In '66 and '67, I was six one, two twenty five, and ran a four eight forty. Today, that would be considered very small and very slow for college football <laughs> players. Uh, but I was actually one of the—I I wasn't the biggest. I was one of the, probably in the top four or five biggest kids we had on the team. So anyway, when we got back, we had a much. When I got back uh, after my red shirt junior year, we had. Uh, you know, 15 or 20 more black kids, and they were, hey, they were faster. And uh, uh, the lo- short story is they put me on the defensive line. Coach Van Sant was the defensive line coach, and he said, uh, he told me, he says, uh, you're out of the backfield, buddy. He said, uh, you're going to play for me? And he said, I'm going I'm to make you sweat blood and make your heart pump piss. He said, you don't <laughs> like it, you can he said, if you don't like it, you can leave. And I started oh. nine games. Uh, I don't think we played but nine games. I started every game that year. Man, that's, an, then, awesome, that's an awesome quote. Awesome quote. Uh, Vance, he's a whole other story. He was – anyway, we'll get into him maybe later. But uh, yeah, that staff resigned as football coach, stayed on as athletic director, and hired Mike McGee. And uh, Mike was uh, – his agenda didn't really include fifth-year seniors. He wanted to start fresh, I guess, and I only started probably, I don't know, half the games my senior year. And then, of course, I think Mike left the next year and went to Duke. Right. Uh, 
But that, and, that was and, my... and Duke, Duke was, of course, his alma mater. And so. Right. That's right. Now, Van Sant, let me tell you, Van Sant was one of those special people in time. Uh, he was a man's man. He asked no quarter, gave no quarter, was never, <laughs> never, never, never played for a tougher coach. Uh, never learned more, uh, and, and so many of my old teammates, I mean, we still have so much respect. I remember uh, Kevin Moran, who was a great player at East Carolina. Years later, after we'd all graduated, we were at some kind of social function. Kevin had a beer in his hand, and he was probably, by then, he's probably 35 years old. And uh, Coach Vance sat walked in the room, and Kevin hid that beer. He, he said, I can't let Coach see me drinking a beer. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the kind of, that's the kind of respect we had for that man. He, he, he right. was something else. Yeah, that's what um, I remember. I, I was fortunate to get to know him a little bit. I'm more of an acquaintance than a friend, uh, but I just um, crossing paths with him sometimes from my family and I being uh, such strong supporters of the program and attending a lot of games and so forth. I, I remember back in the mid-'90s when um, – when he was an, an AD at the time, uh, assistant AD, and um, and Henry Van Sant was uh, nice enough to give us a tour through um, the renovated Williams Arena or when it was uh, nearing completion. Yeah, and it's 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 a crying shame that the uh, politics at that time were such that they didn't hire Henry Van Sant as the head coach when Stasevich resigned. He should have. I mean. It, uh, you know how the, he didn't have a name, and they wanted to bring a name in, and that's why they brought Mike McGee in. Uh, but Henry Van Sant knew the program. He knew the players. He he went to East Carolina. He played at East Carolina. I mean, he was he, he bled East Carolina, and it was it's just a crying shame that they didn't keep him as the head coach. And then years later, it's all, I, I, I agree, or this is just my opinion, uh, that they should have hired him as the athletic director. I mean, hell, he went to Alabama, got his doctorate, was prepared, had every, he had everything but the name. You know, I mean, the the big time name. The he, I, right. Uh, he had every. He should. He should have two times in his life. He should have been the head coach, and he should have been the athletic director at East Carolina. And something else, when I think of Dr. Henry Van Sant, um, and we discussed this when we were setting up the interview, is um, the way he was such a I mean, he, I know he loved the Pirates, period, but he was at so many East Carolina baseball games at Old Harrington Field before Clark LeClair Stadium was built, and uh, he would always sit out in center field, and then when the new ballpark was built, um, there's a there's a seat with a plaque out there um, that has, uh, I'm trying to remember, if some bronze peanuts or popcorn or maybe both uh, that um, kind of commemorating uh, Dr. Van Sant's uh, spot that he typically held in the ballpark. Yeah, yeah, I can remember going to East Carolina games before they built the new stadium. Uh, it's old. What was it? Harrington Stadium. Yeah, Harrington Field. Uh, Harrington Field. Uh, uh, when I was living down there, uh, I'd go over to the baseball games. Coach Van Sant and I would sit out and sit out in the outfield bleachers and watch the game and talk it over. Talk about old times. Uh, absolutely, and um, I know obviously. Football practice and the way things were done were much different in those days, and even in, even in my days in the in the uh, late '90s and early 2000s, in terms of my high school and college career. So, uh, give us a glimpse behind the scenes and tell us what a, a practice under Clarence Stasevich and uh, Dr. Henry Van Sant at, at that time what it what it was like. Well, it was always I, I always thought we could have had better football teams. If we could have constant, spent our time in practice concentrating on our assignments and our drills and getting better at being football players, one of the problems back then was we had to spend a lot of time in practice trying to figure out how to last through practice. It was so physically demanding. I mean, they had one water break. You got a cup of water every two hours or something like that. You know, back then they thought, withholding water from you would make you tougher. Right. <laughs> I guess they found out later it's just killing people, uh, you know. <laughs> right. They used to make you take salt tablets, and they found out later that was killing people. Right. Uh, but just surviving practice was a lot of, uh, unless you were a backer, receiver, if if you were a lineman or, I mean, down in the pits and 
you know, working hard, uh, just surviving practice was one of your biggest goals back then. I and mean, you know, these kids today, bless their heart. I, and I, I would, I would like to have come up today and been able to live in an air conditioned dorm. There wasn't a dorm on campus that had air conditioning back then. You know, we'd come in, come in after two a days or three a days, and you're cutting, and you're bleeding, and you're hot in eastern North Carolina. You got sand in your bed. You got <laughs> sand spurs. The practice fields were uh, nothing compared. I mean, just absolutely. After a week or two of practice, there wasn't any grass on the practice fields. <laughs> uh, we get sand spurs in our knees and our elbows. Uh, like <laughs> junk, junk, junction boys. Exactly. Well, yeah, that's ju- I think. I mean, Coach Stass patterned himself. A, a lot around Bear Bryant. Uh, you know, he'd go out. I remember our freshman year, just like Bear Bryant used to go out and hire all those 180-pound fullbacks and make guards and tackles out of them and keep them down there around people's ankles. That's the way that they played back then. Right. And Coach, <laughs> Coach Stass was a, a disciple of that. Uh, uh, you know, he our freshman year, I don't remember if we had 110, 120, 130 freshmen, but a lot of them were high school fullbacks that he turned into linemen. And a lot of them didn't stay because of that, but some of them did. We had some good <laughs> ones. That's why we had an undefeated team, I guess. But, uh, uh, you know, the, the, it was tough back then. I, it, I, them, you, that sounds like an old man talking, but, my God, it was tough back then. <laughs> you didn't get any water, and uh, they worked you <laughs> They worked you hard, and no, no air conditioning in the dorms, and meals. We had $25 worth of meal books if you're on scholarship every two weeks and if you went into the cafeteria and got a, a glass of tea they t- tear a dime out of your meal book <laughs> or if you get a, a you get a slice of bread they tear a penny out of your meal book and if you got a full meal they'd tear like i don't know a dollar out of your meal book or something and that's all we had to eat back then and today they got these you know nutrition stations and training right. tables and uh it, it was different. It was different. I'm glad right. I went through it. I wouldn't want to go through it again, but I'm glad I went through it. It's kind of like going into the Marines, I guess. Right. Kind of kind of on that same topic uh, here in the last two weeks or so, we had Christina Parrish, who's who's our first ever director of sports nutrition in East Carolina. Yeah. Uh, we had a good conversation with her and just talking about uh, all of her responsibilities and what all it entails with uh, with the football team and the other athletic teams. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it well, it's it's a whole different. It's a, there's a science to it today, and back then it was just, you know, stack the wounded and keep marching. Right, that's one of the things that's funny because, like, like you're saying, as far as the water, I remember my dad who played, uh, he played um, club football on the college level, but then he he had played um, high school at North Forsyth in the Winston Salem area, and he was just saying that in there in the late '60s and. Right around 1970, and like you said, uh, the water breaks. And he said, and like they would give them a, a piece of ice to suck on, and, or, or like well, a, in like high you, school, Coach Hal, uh, Babe Hal, who was a legendary coach, uh, they give us halfway through practice, they'd give us like two ice cubes, and you wouldn't <laughs> believe the, the measures we'd go through to conserve every drop of that. We'd turn our helmets upside down and put the two ice cubes in it and suck the water out of the air holes in the helmet which meant we were just sucking sweat and stuff down into our bodies. And there was, <laughs> there was a creek over on the edge of the practice field. And back in the 60s, there was probably a lot of straight piping sewage into that creek. We called it Crap Creek. Uh, <laughs> but every once in a while during practice, you'd tell the quarterback, says, throw, throw me one out of bounds. I'm going over the creek. And so he'd throw one over there, and you'd tumble down into the creek and lap up that nasty water, I mean, just to survive. Oh man! But but we hey, did. Did Coach Howell say? He say you taking too long getting back. Uh, what what took you so long after that incomplete pass? He caught he caught on. <laughs> yeah, why'd you stay down over the bank so long? But yeah. <laughs> oh man. Um, well, during during your time as a pirate, uh, I know um, guys like Terry Bradshaw uh, from Louisiana Tech, who of course uh, went on. A, a tremendous career with the Pittsburgh Steelers, and then Mercury Morris with West, Te- West Texas State uh, went on to a fine career uh, with the Miami Dolphins. And so, guys like that, uh, what are your memories against playing 
some of those guys and then uh, maybe some others that I didn't mention? Well, first, I remember uh, my sophomore year, uh, I was pl- I was playing out on second team defensive end, I believe, uh, at, when we played uh, West Texas State in Greenville. And Mercury Morris was the running back, and there was an unknown freshman or sophomore fullback then named Dwayne Thomas. And I don't know if you remember him, but he went on to win a couple of Super Bowls with the Dallas Cowboys. So they had a pretty good backfield. They had Mercury Morris and Dwayne Thomas. And I remember they were ahead of us late in the game, and uh, they sent me in and said, okay, don't even go to the defensive huddle. Just just put your defensive end, stay 10 yards outside the ball, and when the ball snaps, block, uh, just just go 10 yards upfield and make sure you turn Morris in towards the line so maybe somebody else <laughs> can tackle him, you know, just contain him. That's all they want me to do. And, of course, first play I went in there, I was all fired up. I didn't go to the huddle. I boxed up 10 yards up the field. He dipped his shoulders, went to the line of scrimmage. I turned my shoulders, and he went right back around outside of me. And I had to run like hell just to get down there in time for the extra point. <laughs> Uh, it's the fastest yeah. human I've ever seen. And then uh, I remember playing against Bradshaw, my, uh, I guess it was my junior year in Greenville, against Louisiana Tech. And uh, he was uh, he was the only thing they had. But he was so good, they'd keep nine people in the block and send one receiver out. And given enough time, that one receiver would get open and he'd hit him. And I, he's the only player I ever played against where you could hear the seams on the football, you could hear them cutting the air when they went over, when it went over your head. It just, I mean, he threw it so hard. I remember tipping a pass of his one time, and it hurt my hands so bad that I was reluctant to try to tip another one. He was he was a man among boys. He he was an outstanding football player. Sounds like was, sounds like David Garrard to him. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know Bradshaw. Man, he had a strong arm. Now, when I was coaching, I remember uh, uh, I'm going to have trouble remembering the name now. Uh, we went up to play North Carolina State. Uh, Lawrence Taylor? Lawrence Taylor. Uh, we were running the wishbone. Uh, I was the offensive line coach, and we decided that we were going to run an unbalanced line, and we ran a tackle over on the right side. He was playing right defensive end. And we said, we're not going to even attempt to run it, Lawrence Taylor. Um, we're just going to run everything to the, to the right side and hope he doesn't get there, not even try to block him. Well, Tony Collins was our running back. You know who he is. Played, what, eight oh, yeah. years or so in the NFL. And uh, we had so we had an NFL caliber running back, and we would run the tall sweep to the right, and Lawrence Taylor would – chase him down before he could get back to the line of scrimmage from the other side, from our left <laughs> side. And, and I remember Ed telling me one time, says, can't you do anything about that? And I said, buddy, unless you got a hand grenade in your pocket, I, I don't, I have no answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, yeah, I remember some of those old NFL films um, and um, w- where the players were mic'd up or so forth, and I I remember uh, hearing LT on the on the field just barking like a like a dog. Yeah, he was a, he was an animal. There's no question about that. So uh, we what did, did that... the same thing down to Florida. We we I think we opened up with Florida State that year, and we went down to Tallahassee. Bobby Bowden was the coach, and uh, we ran that unbalanced uh, uh, wishbone. Maybe that was I, I can't remember if that was the first game or first time we'd run it, and we ran a tackle over. And uh, it screwed them up. We they kicked up. We won a toss. They kicked off to us. I mean, we went bam, 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 opening drive. Stuck it in. We're ahead seven to nothing. Well, they had superior talent, and they figured out how to uh, put an extra linebacker in there and just just uh, uh, mirror the tailback. And uh, they ended up beating us sixty three to seven. I think it was. We could. Yeah. We could they had that. Uh, uh, def- that uh, middle guard, I can't think of his name. He was, he was the strongest football player in America at that time. Uh, nose guard, I can't remember his name, but uh, we we couldn't block him. And uh, that, and I think Florida had beaten somebody that afternoon. And Bobby Bowden wanted to run the score up. Uh, they were ahead 
late in the game, I don't know, 40 points, and he was still throwing touchdown passes. He didn't right. call the dogs off at all. So um, you talk about that influence that Clarence Dasovich and especially Henry Van Sant had on you. So was that what that combined with the fact that you uh, came from came from a home where your dad was a coach? Um, it, is, did all those things combine to uh, make you want to go into coaching? Yeah, I guess that's my daddy was a coach, and I've been in it involved all my life. Yeah, so I went into coaching after college. I coached. Uh, I see. My first job was uh, well. I moved back to Texas, where my daddy had taken a job at, uh, as a basketball coach at the East Texas State University, which is now Texas A and M at Commerce. Okay. It was East Texas State University in Commerce, Texas, uh, as the head basketball coach. And so when I graduated, I went out there, and he found me a assistant coaching job in a small high school. And I did that, I think, one year. And I came back and uh, got married and uh, became the head coach at West Craven High School down in Vanceboro. Um, and my junior quarterback was Clay Jordan. And Clay had an outstanding career as a head coach at West Craven uh, for several decades, you know, after he got out of college. I think he coached Justin Hardy, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, anyway... Probably so. Uh, I, I, I remember. Uh, I remember well when <clears throat> Justin Hardy came as an invited walk-on. Yeah, uh, I, I don't remember, but he coached two or three, two or three or four kids that went on and played in the NFL uh, out of West Craven High School. But he was my uh, quarterback when I was the head coach at West Craven. He was just a junior then. I stayed there one year, and then uh, I wanted to get into college coaching and. Um, um, a guy who had coached at East Texas where my daddy was got the head job at Western New Mexico University in Silver City, New Mexico. So I went out there and coached the offensive line for a couple of years. And then uh, Oval James hired me at uh, Gardner-Webb College. Okay. So I moved back and uh, coached there for a couple of years. And I went to Eastern Illinois University uh, as offensive line coach. Uh, Daryl Mudra had come in. He would He had coached at Florida State. And they hired him at, uh, well, John Constantinos was the head coach. He coached at North Carolina State with uh, Lou Holtz. And he hired me to coach the offensive line. And I stayed there one year, and they fired John. And back then, you know, they didn't have any uh, uh, any good deals for assistant coaches. So when the head coach got fired, fired all the assistants were gone, too. And I took uh, – I had um, – made a few phone calls and got a job uh, coaching for Don Denning at Delta State University in Mississippi. But it's a funny story, or an interesting story. I was cleaning out my desk when uh, Dar- uh, Daryl Moodra came in, and I'd never met him, and you know, he they'd already hired him as the new head coach at, e- at Eastern Illinois. And we, as coaches do, we sat down and started drawing X's and O's on the board and uh, talking about football and that evening before I left, he said, I'll tell you what, I want you to stay here and be be my defensive coordinator. And I said, but I've never coached defense. I've always coached offense. He said, that's why I want you to be my defensive coordinator. He said, you know how offenses attack defenses, and that'll help you. I'd never thought of it in that way. And uh, he said, think about it overnight. And I thought about it, and in Illinois, it was like 20 degrees below zero and 40 degree below zero wind chill factor and I said this old southern boy needs to get back to the south so I went in the next day and I uh, told him I appreciate the offer but I think I'm going to go ahead and take this job down at Delta State University in Mississippi and uh, he said okay I understand he said by the way the the new offensive coordinator is here would you like to meet him I said sure he said Jim Gudger this is Mike Shanahan wow (laughs) the uh the the uh, short story to that is they won the Division Two national championship the next year, and to this day I'll never know if I'd stayed at Eastern Illinois and been the defensive coordinator if I would have ended up coaching the Denver Broncos with Mike Shanahan or if I'd have screwed everybody up so bad that Mike Shanahan nobody know who he was now <laughs> I'll, I'll never know that I'll never know the answer to that. So. Um... 
earlier you referenced how you were on Ed Emery's staff when you were talking uh, that Lawrence Taylor story. So how did, how did that work out for you to come back to your alma mater and coach the Pirates? Well, it was a dream come true. That's what I wanted. To, that, that, I mean, that's what I'd always wanted to do uh, was end up at East Carolina. And uh, I did. Uh, coached the offensive line that year. We had some pretty good players. Uh, I coached Tootie Robbins, who in, who played, uh, uh, what, 15 years in the NFL for the St. Louis Cardinals, I believe. Ernest right. Reiner was on that team. Jody Schultz. Uh we we recruited a lot of pretty good football players back then. So, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, I was just saying I didn't know if you had anything else to that you would um and like to share as far as being on Ed Emery's staff. Obviously, um, you I know you were gone by this point, but tremendous season a few years later, and a lot of those guys that you just referenced, like Ernest Biner and so on. Um, they were key cogs on that 1983 team. Yeah, uh, John Floyd, I coached him. Uh, he was. They were pretty good. Uh, um, you know, Ed and I got a little crossways. He wanted me. He wanted me to coach the tight ends, and I wanted to coach the offensive line. And uh, we got a little crossways, and it didn't. It didn't work out. Ed was also uh, bless his heart, but uh, there's nothing that Ed Emery wouldn't do to win a football game or recruit a football player and I wasn't really into all that but uh, so anyway I left and uh, then I got my securities license and insurance license went into business and never did coach again after 1980 so um, so talk a little bit about life after uh, life after football and life after coaching and um, I, I know uh, the relationships that you developed in football uh, were were something that were were huge in your your business your business career. Yeah, um, like I said, I, I I had a friend uh, Butch Colson who uh, started his own little broker dealer there in Greenville, and uh, I went to work with him, and uh, we had pretty much pretty much success and uh, selling uh, mutual funds. We sold mutual funds back in the 80s, I guess it was, and nobody ever heard of them back then. We we did really well. Uh, there weren't that many, and now there are thousands of them, and you can't make any money selling them anymore. But uh, I've been in sales. Uh, I retired one time at age 62 and uh, about went crazy and came back and uh, had one of the best jobs I've ever had in my life selling warranty, automobile warranties to car dealers. So. It's been an interesting, uh, <laughs> an, an, an interesting journey. But a lot of the things we learned in football, particularly from people like Henry Van Sant, uh, you know, just helps true in life. You know, if you just persevere and do the little things right. Uh, we had a, I worked with one company selling dental equipment. We actually sold dental equipment all over the world, and I traveled all over the world doing that. And the, the little things like, uh, you know, don't, don't take the easy way out, like trying to send emails and texts and and sales and phone calls. Right. You know, you get you get your butt in the car, and drive up there. I don't care if it's a two or three hour drive, and show up, knock on the door. They can't turn you away nearly as easily as they can put the phone down. And absolutely, I had, a lot, I had quite a bit of success in sales uh, doing that, and I attributed a lot of that to the fundamentals that I learned uh, on the football field. It had, you know, there's a lot of toughness involved too. Where you sometimes you just don't want to do things, and you, but but you've made yourself do things you didn't want to do before, so it's it's not unnatural. I had some great teammates, uh, some of the toughest men I've ever met in my life. I remember Mike McGurk. We called him Iron Mike. Uh, he was uh, he he played wing back on single wing, and then he played defensive end later on. Uh, I think he was one of those five guys that started out with us in '66, this freshman that ended up five years later. Uh, but uh, Harold Glatley, one of the toughest, meanest men I've ever met in my life. <laughs> you, you made me start reminiscing <laughs> myself here. Go ahead. Is there anything? Is there anything you, you want to know? Um, 
one of the things I wanted to ask you about, and this is working uh, way in reverse, um, but something I meant to ask you um, when we were talking about your time at East Carolina, um, I know uh, I'd seen this in another interview that uh, Ron Cherubini, who did an excellent job back in the early 2000s uh, with, for several years uh, with Bonesville.net uh, writing the Pirate Time Machine articles. Uh, look forward to hopefully having Ron on the show. Um, but but Ron, um, he had asked you a question about, about maybe one of your favorite memories or favorite place to uh, to attend at ECU as far as downtown, and you uh, referenced the Elbow Room and told a story about how the, the Elbow Room uh, got its name. So I'm sure a lot of our listeners are familiar with the Elbow Room, uh, and I know I know my dad is definitely one of those, so, so uh, tell him that story. Well, when I was a freshman, that place was called the Coaching Four, and it was uh, – uh, had the dubious distinction of selling the most beer of any place in the state of North Carolina, east of Raleigh, I think. Uh, and back then, the drinking age was 18, you know. Uh, so if you, you, know, you came to college as a freshman, you could go to the, at the coaching four and drink beer. And they had a they had a good sound system. They had a drummer, and that just added to it. And, of course, this little country boy had never <laughs> – I mean, Greenville was a big city to me back then. And uh, that was our that was the place we we hung out. Well, a couple of three years later, they opened a place right up the street. Uh, well, the coaching floor closed down because I, the story I got was somebody absconded with all the money and went to South America or something. I don't know what story, but anyway, it went down. And they opened a place right up the street on the corner of Cotanch and Fourth. It was an old red and white supermarket. Uh, God, I can't remember the name of the club now. But anyway, it, it became the popular place to go. Nobody went to the coach and four anymore. And a friend of mine named Steve Rhodes had bought the coach and four. And we were in there one night, uh, and he was just lamenting. He said, boys, i got to do something. He said, you know, they've, uh, they've taken all my business at this new place up the street. I need to just start all over, change the name and everything. Well, me and... Grover Trusselow and Richard Peeler and Mole Man Monroe had gone to Fort Lauderdale for spring break that year and taken a, and we'd hung around at a place that we saw in the movie called Where the Boys Are with Connie Francis, I don't remember who else, back, back in the 60s, called the Elbow Room uh, right on the beach in Fort Lauderdale. And I'd taken a camera and taken pictures and everything, and I said, hey, I need to show you these pictures this place called the Elbow Room, where we hung out for spring break in Fort Lauderdale. And Steve took a look at those, and the next thing I knew, he had copied them. I guess he'd get in violation of copyright laws today. But I don't know if you remember, the E lean left and the L lean right and the B lean back and the O. I mean, he copied their logo. Okay, no, no I, I've actually never seen the logo for the Elbow Room. Well, it was uh, the exact same logo that they had for the Elbow Room in the uh, Fort Lauderdale, but there was absolutely no relationship, you know, between the two. And I don't remember what was that, 69 or 70, 69 probably. And uh, it became the elbow room, and gosh, I went back when I coached at East Carolina in 80. I know it was still there. Uh, I don't remember how long it lasted after that, but it was there for, I don't know, another 20 years probably as the elbow room. And I know um, now, Jim, you, you're back in the the Asheville area, uh, living. Uh, so, um, so back there, uh, where you grew up, in that general area. And um, although you're still five pl five plus hours away from Greenville, um, you um, still have a very strong love and support of the Pirates. And you were actually down in, in Greenville this past weekend uh, for the the ribbon cutting with um, with Town Bank Tower, and we're able to. To take in the, the scrimmage and so forth, and we're able to attend media day. So uh, talk about you know, your love of the Pirates, and then I, also um, we'll, we'll talk about the relationship you had um, with East Carolina head coach Mike Houston. Yeah, I mean, when I when I started at East Carolina in 66, they had wooden bleachers on the, on the north side of the field where the club level is now, and they just had one, the middle section, on the south side, I think the stadium capacity is like ten thousand. So I've seen it go. I've seen it go. I mean, we had big wooden 
telephone poles for night games, you know, for right for in, in, fr- in front of the in front of the stand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. And uh, so I've seen it go. And, and Menji's, there was nothing there. I mean, there was literally the only building was the we had a concrete, no white concrete block building uh, outside the stadium for a halftime room. We we dressed. Uh, at the old gym down on 10th, 10th Street. What was the name of that gym? Uh, old Christian's Bay? Yeah, yeah, Christian Berry Gym on 10th Street. Our dressing room was in the basement of that, and we had to ride to practice on a bus every day. <laughs> uh, and, and the funny story there was we'd go over, the, when you turned in, there was kind of a, um, a slant to the road there, and we figured if we could all lean to the left when that bus turned in we could turn the bus over maybe we wouldn't have to go to practice that day if we wrecked the bus uh, but we never we never did get it turned over but okay. anyway uh so so we would uh go to practice every day on that old bus and uh the the only building there like i said was that little halftime building uh, uh where, where we could go in at halftime there there weren't any dressing rooms or anything over there then so i've seen it go from uh, to what we have now, you know, from like I said, wooden bleachers and nothing else over there, to, uh, to what we have now, and it's it's just amazing. It's uh, you know, hats off and great tribute to everybody that's been involved in that. And uh, and, and East Carolina's uh, new head coach Mike Houston, uh, he actually uh, got his start uh, in the Asheville area at TC Robertson High School, so. Um, and you had the opportunity to, I guess, that was that the first time you met Coach Houston? Well, actually, I never met him uh, then. My son uh, had weightlifting classes uh, with him uh, two or three years, and I don't remember exactly, two or three years in high school. And uh, I saw I saw Mike, uh, of course, I've, seen, I've met him several times uh, since he's been at East Carolina. And I ran into him the other day uh, after the sc- or before the scrimmage. He came up, and we had a, a special group of Pirate Club people that were able to watch the scrimmage in the club level. And he came up, talked to us beforehand. And he walked up to me. My son's name's J.R., James Robert. He, As soon as he saw me, he said, hey, t- how's James Robert doing? Tell him I said hello. I mean, he he's that kind of guy. He, he remembers names and everything. But he coached, uh, well, he, he played at Franklin High School, which is 20 miles from where I played high school football, Silva, Silva Webster High School. His wife actually went to Silva Webster High School. Now we're talking obviously decades of difference than when I was there and when she was there and when he was at Franklin. But uh, there's a lot, just a lot of ties there. You know, he coached at Lenore Ryan. I coached at Lenore Ryan. He played at Mars Hill. We used to play Mars Hill when I was coaching at Lenore Ryan. Uh, and also yeah, Donnie, yeah. Donnie, Donnie Kirkpatrick, too, and his, that tie yeah, to Lenore Ryan. Well, he'd been a quarterback and receiver there in the late seventies and early eighties. Yeah, I was. I coached at Lenore Ryan in seventy nine. Uh, Donnie was a junior quarterback. Jack Huss was the head coach, and they fired Jack at the end of the season and hired Henry Van Sant. And I was mm-hmm. elated. I was going to get to coach uh, at Lenore Ryan with Henry Van Sant, and he came in. Uh, I guess I was the only coach on the staff that he kept. I can't remember. But uh, in the interim there, though, Ed Emery, in the, within a month or so of that happening, Ed Emery had offered me the offensive line job at East Carolina. So I went down there, and I never got to coach with Coach Van Sant. But Donnie Kirkpatrick was a junior quarterback, if I remember correctly, on that team. Uh, and he's done extremely well and doing a good job. Did a great job. James Madison doing uh, done well at East Carolina. And John Gilbert, I think he didn't he go to Lenore Ryan? Yeah, uh, man, John, John Gilbert was he was actually a football player as well um, at Lenore Ryan. Yeah, so, so that's that's a stadium. That's thing. a stadium that's uh, awesome uh, right there between the bricks, Mar- Marette Stadium. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We talked about Hanley Painter, who was the old time athletic director uh, years ago. Hanley was another story. He still had shrapnel in his leg from Iwo Jima, and he was a Marine during World War II. Uh, he was another amazing story. But uh, I guess he got the head football job when Coach Stasevich left Lenore Ryan to go to East Carolina, and Hanley coached at uh, Lenore Ryan for a while after that, if I remember correctly. So... Um 
So going into Coach Houston's first season at the helm, um, I'm sure you're you're like most of Pirate fans, and obviously you've, uh, in addition to just knowing what Coach Houston's accomplished at uh, three different stops as a head college coach at Lenore Ryan, uh, the Citadel, and James Madison, uh, playing for three national titles and winning one of them, um, you have to feel great about where Pirate football's headed. Well, I mean, the man's got an 80 and 25 record. Right. <laughs> that's uh, outstanding. I don't care what league you're coaching in. I mean, uh, that is outstanding. And I saw a lot of the principals. Uh, I've seen him practice a couple times, and I've talked to him, talked to his coaches, and I've seen a lot of the principals that Henry Van Sant and Harold Bullard, he was another great coach, assistant coach at East Carolina, that those people instilled in us back then that these guys still think are necessary today. You know, you win with blocking and tackling. You don't win by outsmarting people very often. You win by lining up and beating their butts. And I think that's the way uh, Mike's uh, going to do it. I noticed uh, walking through the dressing room after the scrimmage Saturday, uh, I was very impressed with the young men and with the football players. Uh, you know, they see an old white-haired man walking through there, most most. Teenagers, most college kids just turn, avoid their head, you know, avert their gaze so they don't have to talk to them. And these kids would say, let me get the door for you. How are you, sir? You know, it, it was very refreshing, you know. Hey, right. how you doing? You know, you know. I mean, some somebody's trained them well. And I don't think it was all of their parents. I think Mike Houston had a lot to do with it. <laughs> Absol- with absolutely. That's, that's something here. Um, when you told me that story or – that story earlier off the air, um, it made me think of um, here in the last four or five days, maybe it was um, before the end of last week before our second scrimmage, and there was a video put by ECU Football's Twitter account um, out there, and they had Coach Houston addressing the team after practice, talking about the importance of uh, welcoming our alums and uh, football letter winners back into the fold, and so um, I, that goes right along with that, what he's been preaching to him, and that, that's awesome to hear. And that's that's really something that stood out. Uh, it seems as though recruiting's going very well. Obviously, you never know until they show up on campus and play. Uh, but it seems as though things are going very well, and I've noticed that a lot of these guys that we've offered, not only have they had a lot of um, the so-called Power 5 or Autonomy 5 offers, but they've also had uh, – um, a lot of them, multiple offers from from academies, uh, the the navies, the armies, the air force. Mm-hmm. So so that gives you an idea of the probably um, what they are in terms of in terms of a student and their character. Well, you win with football players first. You win with with good athletes, with talented athletes, and I have noticed that you know, like you just said, we have recruited some players that a lot uh, away from you know we've beaten a lot of players that we wouldn't normally have beaten uh, and we've beaten a lot of uh, colleges well like you said uh, power five colleges I hate to see where we recruit a player and he only had an offer from you know Fresno State or Slippery Rock or something like that it was his only other offer but when you recruit a player that's been offered by you know Syracuse or West Virginia or North Carolina or something like that, uh, you know that means we're getting we should be getting better better talented players. Uh, and you Absolutely. win with talent. Well, Jim, uh, it's been awesome catching up and hearing about your time in the purple and gold and. Um, Playing for Clarence Dasovich, obviously a, a true legend in the coaching ranks and at Lenore Ryan and East Carolina. Uh, um, but we'd love to have you back on again down the road, maybe sometime during the season, to talk some pirate football. And uh, ho- hopefully, we'll uh, catch up with you in Greenville this fall. Well, I hope so too. And you know, one thing I don't know who who listens to this, but uh, if there are any other old East Carolina ex-players, you know, I, I am a little dismayed at the participation in the Pirate Club of some of our older ex-players. Uh, we need more and more of those guys involved. Uh, they're at the point in their life where financially they ought to be pretty stable and, and be able to do a, a better job supporting the Pirates. You know, uh, um, there's not that many of us, just a handful of right. those former players of my era, now that I'm talking about, that uh, get season tickets and 
and uh, attend all the home games. I, uh, I make it a point to do that. It's something I love to do. Right. I, uh, I know. I know. Here recently, um, like like. I said in the open, we've had uh, Jerry Tolley on, and that's something he uh, he didn't necessarily talk about the Pirate Club, but he was just talking about how how he had, um, even though he's only been able to make uh, a handful of games per season, like maybe a couple ball games, if that, maybe some seasons, not even at all, but he's continued to buy those season tickets. Yeah, uh, I, I buy a couple season tickets every year, and we have excellent parking. We might have the best parking place in the stadium now. I don't know, but uh, and I, you know, I lived in Greenville uh, for ten years when I was working for BB and T, uh, and I've still got a house down on the water on the Pamlico in Chocolaty. So I, I rent it out now on Airbnb and VRBO, uh, but I keep it always open for the football weekend, so I can go down there and stay and go to the home games, even though it's a five five and a half hour drive down there. Uh, um, anyway, that's just something that. I guess some people want to play golf at Pebble Beach, and I want to go to all these Carolina home games. <laughs> that's right. the way it is. Yeah, um, that's one of those things. Um, I guess the best thing you can say is uh, different strokes for different folks. But uh, uh, but we'll continue to do what we can to uh, get people to support the Pirates. There you go. Go Pirates. Yes, sir. We appreciate your time. Pirate Nation, that is former East Carolina football letter winner Jim Gudger. That concludes this edition of 50 Pirates in 50 Days on the Sports Objective. Remember, join us daily between now and game day as we will talk pirate football with players from various eras. All these interviews are available exclusively on SoundCloud and our YouTube channel. Remember to subscribe and follow so you're alerted when we post new content. Thank you so much for listening, and as always, Go Pirates!